they had come to Los Angeles for a conference and I was already kind of crazy about Christian Ray. We had met at a conference a few months before. And so when I met Andy and Tammy, I had a list of questions for them. And I'm sure they had a list for me as well. They were very subtle about it. Um, we had breakfast together that day and I spent uh, the rest of the afternoon with them and the team that had come from Moscow. And they invited me to visit. Oh, I might cry. Um, <laughs> They invited me to uh, go visit Moscow and see what Christian was like in his element and see how things would go there and to stay with them for a week. And so a couple months later, I flew to Moscow. It was February. It was very cold. It, it was definitely not California or Texas weather. And I think that was intentional so that I could see what winter was like. And uh, they were so gracious. And Tammy took me all over the city on these old electric tramvai like trolleys um, across town early in the morning into um, communal housing to visit sisters and to serve and she was such an amazing example there and it was it was non-stop but also like can you see what it's like here in Russia like the real the hard parts the challenges that there are and then Christian would take me out in the evenings to the museums and the coffee shops and show me all of the romantic sites and of course I fell in love um, with the Flemings with Russia and definitely with Christian the rest is history um, I met Irina there who fortunately spoke English and Svetlana and my now mother-in-law Larissa Grigorevna we uh, I could not speak Russian at all so we spoke in broken Spanish and Portuguese until I learned the language and we had a couple months there together and then you went off again so if you could maybe tell people a little bit about your journey uh, some of the places you've been I know Andy talked about um, some others already sure. but you could so share some. you got you got the story basically from Andy but my you know I was not anything like that I was not at six years old dreaming of becoming a missionary I wanted to be actually I wanted to have a meaningful life which I think everybody does I think everybody's got that somewhere but with me uh, my parents died pretty young and so on my own I kind of raised myself through my teen years and got completely sucked into you know the dream of being uh, a famous rock star Christian made it I didn't quite <laughs> um, but you know that was sort of my dream and uh, that's where I was when God found me and so um, you know my story I became a Christian when my mom had just passed away and I honestly I was really mad at God because I had had a uh, I'd had a conversation with him I, I was kind of trying to find him had read my Bible, was fasting, was trying to keep the Sabbath because people told me Ten Commandments. Well, in the Commandments, you know, keep the Sabbath. Anyway, I was completely frustrated and screamed at God one day and said, "Why is this so hard? You know, I'm. Can you not tell I'm looking for you? Can you not do something?" And honestly, I think that was the first time I actually really asked God for help. And He did answer. Uh, a couple months later, I met the church in Boston and uh, you know Andy was there and you know that's that's kind of how we met so um, I had no dreams at all of going uh, you know into the to ministry Papua New Guinea. no <laughs> Lord no a mission team Russia nothing like that uh, but I was thrilled to be a Christian and so um, you know you say yes to God you kind of <laughs> you say yes to an awful lot of stuff that you didn't realize was might be around the corner you know and so uh, Andy and I started dating and uh, I realized he was he was gonna go lead you know this to plant he lead a life that was very different than what I had envisioned but I knew that God was right and I knew that God in him was right and so I kind of jumped you know I, I made this crazy jump dropped everything extricated myself from my career and uh, sold everything and went on the mission field and so that's how I that's how we wound up together and wound up in Stockholm so and I'd love to hear more about this ripple effect mm -hmm. um, from Stockholm because you didn't stay there you were in Moscow when that's I right. got there and um, just even what you shared about how you prayed and God made it evident one of the things that I remember most is when I came to Moscow I had specific prayers but also before you left again we walked, we walked around Red Square, we walked through mm -hmm. Moscow mm -hmm. and we prayed. And I remember Tammy holding, so women in Russia, when they pray, 
and when they walk, they do yes. this like yes. they link arms totally. like this when they walk totally. Totally. all the time. So the time. my theory is that it's because it's cold and slippery. <laughs> but no, we love each other. No, <laughs> she no, no, held no. on so tight <laughs> and her prayers were so intense. And I, I remember just feeling carried along by the Holy Spirit through your prayers and how powerful they were. And I remember you saying, when I leave, this is what I want people to remember that they're not us and what we did, but what God did and remember to pray and the power of prayer. Totally. So I want to thank you for that. Well, I, absolutely. And I have to say, I really think that, I mean, that's a, a crazy story that Andy mentioned. How do 17 people become 10,000, right? In a de less than a decade, but we watched that happen. It, it's, it's unbelievable. And it, it was, I really believe because the planting of Moscow and if you're visiting today, this church has supported financially, emotionally, spiritually, in prayer, physically visits, you know, special contributions for years. Has so, you know, you, you guys are part of the ripple effect because any one of you that ever has given a prayer, a special contribution, anything, you know, to the Eurasian churches, this is your ministry. This is, we couldn't do this without you. Um, and even though the churches are self-supporting, right, there are some still are in great need. And, you know, we can talk about more of that, about that later. But um, I th really think the reason why it was so incredibly uh, successful was because people prayed all over the world. At, you know, Russia is our enemy in all the movies, right, still. But, you know, the, it just captured the fantasy, I think, of all the American Christians, no matter where they were. Wow, a team of you know teenagers and campus students is going from the United States into the Soviet Union. Everybody was praying. The whole world was praying for that group. And I, I really think that that's what made the difference, to be honest. Amen. Well, can you tell us since then, um, mm -hmm. the ripple effect, as we see here, keeps going and, and is happening around the world. It does. But can you share some specific things yeah. that God has done recently, how you see the ripple so, effect now? Uh, just one that even started way back. One of the mission team, original mission team members, you know this family, probably have heard of them, Bill and Sally Hooper, from here in the Texas churches, um, their elder and elder's wife, and they, a ripple effect, I mean, you know, the decision to, in the 90s, early 90s, let their kids go abroad and be part of these mission teams when there was no internet, there's no cell phone. You, I mean, you're not, you're not going to talk to them. You're not going to see them. You know, they're, they're going behind the Iron Curtain into a communist country, and that's it, right? So that decision was unbelievable. Leanne, which is Bill and Sally's daughter, was on the mission team, and she and I and actually a lot of us spent loads of time with a young woman called Vika, Russian woman. We met her on the street. She came around and we, we, so much was happening. We couldn't, we did what Christian was sharing earlier about, you know, we have a daily, we have a weekly life, Sundays only part of it. We really believed in that. And I think that's another ripple thing, you know, that when you make a decision that we're going to be daily, weekly involved in each other's lives. And it wasn't just Leanne and Vika or me and Vika. It was, we were, you know, really a little community. But Vika learned a lot, um, honestly, about Bill and Sally's life through Leanne and uh, Vika eventually, you know, grew up and became a women's minister. She was the first Russian appointed women's ministry leader, worked full time in the ministry and, uh, you know, grew up, got married, you know, lived. And now fast forward to now, they're no longer in the ministry. They're just normal disciples. They lead a Bible talk or a family group or something. They're in real estate or they're doing something else. But their daughter right now caught the dream and is doing exactly what Leanne did. Uh, and what her mom did, and now her daughter is on this new mission team that's been it's been wonderful. It's called Revive Eastern Europe. If you if you're on Instagram or anything, look them up. It's so fun to follow them. But there's a multi generational. Uh, it's kind of like a one year challenge or a uh, you know helping hand thing. But uh, it's so cool because they just completed their first year in Odessa. They thought they were going to go to Budapest, but COVID happened and locked everything down, so they didn't go. But this team went to Odessa and has been revitalizing the youth ministry and the church. They just completely focused for a year on just seeking and saving the lost, serving where they can, uh, and, uh, you know, baptized, I think, 12 people and in involved the church in it and kind of boosted everybody up. So now they're in Kishinev, Moldova, which another um, Soviet republic, it doesn't matter where they are, but 
they're hoping to get into yet another country, another city, and just one by one, slowly spend a year, a couple of years in every church that's struggling in Eastern Europe and bring back the life. So that's, that's what Anya, Vika's daughter, is doing. So had Bill and Sally not sent Leanne, had Leanne not been there, had, Le had we not met Vika, had, you know, all of this... Who knows what would be happening? It's so exciting. It's so exciting to see how God carries it on, um, as you said, multi-generationally. Mm -hmm. I like that this team is multi-generational and that we can see the promise for you and your children and all yeah. those who are far off. For, for our children, yeah. it's been fun hanging out with you guys and hearing updates on what your kids are doing and where they all are now. I won't go into all that, but please ask them more mm -hmm. after. And you started by sharing a little bit about your own family. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love for you to tell us about um, that and the work that you've been doing in particular with grief recovery. Yeah, and yeah. this is thanks to you guys again, honestly, because uh, I know that uh, you have, grief recovery is a, it's a non-faith-based um, program, but absolutely um, digs out the truth of the scripture and, strengthens our hearts when we've had loss right so at a you know my, my parents died when i was young and i uh came across this program it's here in the texas churches and uh, i came across it when ripple effect uh an elder's wife mentioned to me three years in a row you really ought to read this book tammy and uh you know my first year i was like yeah, yeah i should and second year we meet again have you read that book no i haven't third year still haven't read it because I didn't, you know, it didn't speak to me. I didn't feel like I needed it. Well, does that ever happen to you where you, you kind of, somebody tells you, you really ought to do this. You really ought to think about this. And I go, yeah, 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 yeah. Some other time. Uh, but when we, we moved from LA at one point, we'd left Russia when you came. Thank you for coming. We left. I didn't really want to go, but we went to LA, spent several years there, then moved to a ministry in the United Kingdom. And I was devastated looking around at the, the state of the church. Um, I had felt like I'd never seen so many disciples of Christ that were just grieving. I mean, that's all I could say. They, there, there really had been a crisis, a wildfire had, you know, had spread through the churches and um, people had lost dreams. I, I thought my kids would become Christians. They hadn't. I thought I'd get married one day. They hadn't. I thought, um, you know, I don't know, midlife crisis. I don't know what you want to say, but it was really overwhelming. And I felt really sad because I just left my home country again. And my daughter just left home. So I finally pulled the book out, right? And uh, sat down with a friend and went through it. And it was really revolutionary. And then when our, our dream has always been when our kids grow up and become self-sufficient, we always feel like that's, if, since we have kids, that's our number one job from God, right? You, if we didn't have kids, we wouldn't feel that way. But since God gave us children, we figure, well, that's number one. They need to stand firm in Christ first. We do everything we can to help that. And then we can go turn our attention to other things. So when they grew up and we became empty nesters, we always wanted to go back to the former Soviet countries and do whatever we could to finish the work, right? Come alongside the local leaders, do whatever they need. So we got to that point and I realized, oh my gosh, we need grief recovery. <laughs> We really need grief recovery. I mean, the different, maybe different um, details, different specifics, but the same brokenheartedness, you know? And um, so I started just casting around desperately looking for a program that we could translate, we could, that would work in both cultures, that makes sense, that really works, right? And uh, I explored and explored and I came back to grief recovery because it's the best thing out there. And uh, so, you know, thanks to Susie Dininger, who's a part of your church here, really grateful for her support and so many other people, uh, the board of Eurasian Missions that have been so supportive. But again, your special contributions enabled me to write a grant that uh, got us to translate the Grief Recovery Handbook from English into Russian. It's a bestseller here in the United States. So that was huge the disciples did it and they did a phenomenal job so that was like a real feather in their cap and uh, opened up a whole world of new opportunities for our publishing disciples publishing company in in the soviet union in russia but um just this this year we managed to tr thanks to you again to translate i mean to train uh 17 native russian speaking grief recovery specialists 
in uh, seven different churches all across the former Soviet Union. So from the far, far east to the to Eastern Europe, to the western edge of the empire, across 12 time zones. Now we have uh, in every large church a couple of people who are trained. And it's such a joy because it had been it had been a challenge. One of the things that the leadership in the um, the churches there had been asking God about and trying to strategize about was how do we rehabilitate former ministers who no longer want to be in the ministry, can be in the ministry, hit a wall, you know, they're they're just they're not not thriving. They're not thriving. How do we take care of them? How do we reinvent? How do they reinvent themselves? How do we? get others to use their gifts? How do we diversify the leadership, you know? And so this has served so many, ticked so many of those boxes. Uh, the group that we trained turned out to be half former ministry people that were really kind of lost and needing to reinvent themselves, but super gifted and super dedicated, uh, wonderful Christians. And the other half were already trained psychologists and psychotherapists. And just to show you God's hand in this whole thing, I felt like he, you know, we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about every step. Do you want us to do this, God? Should we do this, God? He flung open every gate, it's felt like, like every obstacle he just leveled. Um, and it was so gratifying as we finally did this training. It was five days online, 12 hours a day online. Can you imagine? Simultaneously translated, the trainers here in the States and all these people in all these different time zones. Super grueling. But um, in the in the sort of downtime between the training, the chatter was just so encouraging. And these, these people were saying, I have not been a part of something this exciting since I was on a mission team, uh, since I was a baby Christian, right? One of the um, psychologists said, you know, I'm in training all the time. I go through you know, professional training seminars. He says, this is the best thing I've ever been to. It was so encouraging. So they're working now. They're serving, they're, they're volunteering, and they're, you know, taking people through their programs. And it's just so incredibly gratifying. So thank you, Austin Church, for your support and uh, for being part of this incredible ripple effect. It is amazing. It's amazing how that caught fire. And we know the needs having lived there. And I think even just what Andy was sharing earlier about um, Jesus takes it personally when people persecute his church, the body of Christ. Yeah. And he takes it and feels it personally for each one of us when we're hurting and broken. Mm -hmm. And it's by his wounds that we're healed. Absolutely. And I, I love hearing the stories of the healing mm -hmm. because once we're healed, we can do so much more for God. And that was always his so intention true. as we see through Acts. I know there was a particular story oh, that you yeah, wanted to close you what, with. This is, just, this is just a great story. So um, one of the first women that came through my... Um, my, group, my very first grief recovery group, actually. Um, her name was Natasha, and she wrote, uh, afterwards, she wrote me this uh, testimony, and it's just, it's just so great. I really want to share it with you. So she said, two years ago, I came to this program, Grief Recovery, um, and I was depressed. I was, uh, I didn't understand what, why God was not answering my prayers. Uh, I had had a very difficult and painful divorce from my husband. I just gone, they just gotten divorced, which she could not fathom because she says, we, I thought we did everything right. We met in the church. We dated in the church. We had a pure relationship. We got married in the church. We raised our kids in the church. How did we get here? How did we get here was what she was saying. Uh, she said, my, my main question to God was why? You know, how did this happen? Um, I had a really hard time forgiving my husband. Uh, I thought that my, my, my marriage was just a big mistake. Uh, I had so much resentment toward my husband. Uh, and this was where I was at, she said. And so she went through this grief recovery program, eight weeks in a little group. Um, it basically teaches you to forgive, honestly, and uh, teaches you how to pray, how to dig stuff up out of your, your heart that you've been telling yourself, it's okay, it happens to everybody, it's no big deal, God is good. And that's true, God is good. And as Christian said in the beginning, everything works out, everything's gonna be okay. That's true. But it's also true that I'm in pain right now. And you know, until we're honest about that, sometimes we stop seeing the truth of the fact that everything is gonna be okay. And that's where she was at. And so um, what happened was she went through the program. She actually forgave her husband, 
let go, decide it, just made the decision. I'm going to, like Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. I forgive them. Her circumstances didn't change, but she just decided, I forgive you. But they were already divorced, right? So six months later, they still are raising their kids. They hadn't seen each other. Six months later, he comes back and visits her. And she was so nice to him. He saw this change in her. And a week after that meeting, he comes back on his knees with flowers and says, Natasha, please, can we try again? And so they tried again, right? They decided to try again. Uh, six months after that, they get remarried. They have two teenage daughters. And the great news is they had always hoped for a son. He, the husband always wanted a son. Guess what? She gets pregnant. They have their son. And he says, this is my gift, you know, because he, while she was going through her uh, grief recovery process and, and coming to, to forgiveness, God was working on his heart as well. And when he saw the change in her, he just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. And it gave him hope. And so he went away and began to pray. And, uh, and so there you go. You know, it's just absolutely amazing. So we see them in fellowship all the time. The little guy is now about two. And he's so sweet, and they're so happy. And so thank you again for the ripple effect. This is thanks to you and your support and your faith. And I know it probably feels really far away, but it's very real to me. So thanks for giving me the chance to be able to explain some of these stories for you. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks so much for sharing these very inspiring and encouraging stories. We love you both so much. We're so grateful that you took the time to be here. If you Pleasure. would all please stand and join us for one last song. Thanks.